Anyone needs a Bible? Just raise your hand. We'll make sure we get one to you. We're going to be uh, finishing the Gospel of Luke this morning, and so we'll be doing some reading. And you can always listen along, but we'd love that you can follow along as well. If you need a Bible, we'll give one to you. That's yours to keep. Okay, very good. It's always great when you all are packing. All right. We're going to be in uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 26. So chapter 26. Chapter 23, verse 26. I'm sorry. Chapter 23. Now we left off at verse 25 last time when Pilate had released Jesus to uh, those who wanted him destroyed, those who wanted him crucified. Uh, the Jewish leadership, the mobs, the crowd... Uh, Pilate was apprehensive about it uh, for a number of reasons, as you might recall. Number one, uh, the Romans, though they were harsh and they were hard and they were cruel, they were also known for justice. And so they exacted justice, uh, meted it out quite effectively, but they also held uh, justice as an ideal to shoot for. And so when Jesus was presented uh, to Pilate and he examined him, he didn't find any reason to put him to death. And so the conundrum for Pilate in that instance is that he's going to potentially put to death somebody who is not really guilty of any actual crime. Uh, secondly, he probably also noticed that there was sort of a mob mentality against Jesus, and so it wasn't really uh, a matter of, of seeking justice as, a matter, uh, as much as it was a matter of hatred for him personally. Uh, the other thing that uh, may not be immediately apparent, but uh, you might recall one of the gospel accounts mentions, and I think it's Matthew, that mentions that uh, when Pilate was examining Jesus, word came to him from his wife, uh, Pilate's wife, that, uh, that she had had a dream about Jesus, about this man, as she called him, and that Pilate should have nothing to do with him. Uh, and so... On top of that, the, it began to become known to him that part one of the claims against Jesus was that he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, the Romans were polytheistic. They believed in a number of gods. As a matter of fact, they didn't even mind if you were believed in whatever god you wanted, as long as you held up Caesar uh, and hailed his name as well. And so the Romans were not monotheistic. They believed in a number of gods. And so Pilate now finds himself... Uh, with a bunch of Jewish people in front of him wanting this man dead who claims to be the son of God, Pilate is also now no doubt wrestling with the idea, who exactly am I assenting to his death? Am I in fact putting one of the gods on a cross? Could very well have been one of the things going through his mind. It's a frightening prospect, and he found himself in a place where he just didn't know what to do, and there was no right answer from his perspective. So as you might recall, at one point he washes his hands and says, I am innocent of this. This is all in your hands. I'm washing my hands of this whole thing. And he turns him over, uh, ultimately to be scourged. Now Luke does not record the scourging. He moves right from the release from Pilate to, uh, uh, to, to go to the cross, right into the march to the cross. But in between verses 25 and 26 are the scourging, which we touched on last time, so I won't go into it a whole lot now, except to say that uh, the scourging uh, served a couple of purposes. One was to send a message to criminals in Rome. That and the cross were effective deterrents to crime. When you realize that this was the response to crime in Rome, you didn't really cross Rome. I guess you could say pun intended. Um, the other thing was that the scourging and the subsequent other kinds of beatings at the hands of the Romans, the soldiers, also served the purpose of, uh, of, of beating confessions out of the criminals who were arrested. Uh, typically, if uh, as, as a Roman would bring down this cat of nine tails that, uh, as we mentioned last time, was a whip and essentially with nine strands of leather uh, interwoven in which with pieces of bone or pot pottery that was broken in that, so that when it latched into the back of the person that was being scourged and the whip was pulled out, it would literally rip hunks of flesh off of the back and sides of this victim. Uh, it was a horrifying thing to do. Uh, and when you think about it in those terms and you begin to understand just what a gruesome sight this was, and honestly, uh, if any of you saw The Passion of the Christ, probably most of you did, that was probably the most accurate depiction, but even that didn't go far enough. Uh, it was utterly horrifying to see a human being put through this kind of torture. 
And it had to be equally horrifying as if you were a bystander to watch the kind of bloodlust that not only the soldiers had in performing such an act, but also the Pharisees, the scribes, those who wanted Jesus dead and knew that this was coming. Nevertheless, they wanted him to have to, to die, and even to die in such a horrible way. Uh, and so this was uh, an absolutely gruesome thing. So this is happening now between verses 25 and 26. Now as we move into verse 26 and we make our march to the cross, and as we look at Jesus on the cross, uh, we're going to see here, and I'll, I'll, I'll make reference as we go, but we'll see echoes really of Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, very well-known passages in the Old Testament in terms of their messianic nature. They, they speak of the cross uh, and the sufferings of Jesus actually in greater detail uh, from, a, from, from seemingly a first-person uh, perspective than even the New Testament does. Uh, and so we'll refer to it as we go through just lightly here because our point is not, uh, you'll notice here when uh, the simplicity with which not only Luke but all the gospel writers when they speak of Jesus' crucifixion, they simply mentioned that he was crucified. No description is given, no time is spent developing that thought, simply that he was crucified. And so one of the dangers that we can sometimes fall into, and I don't want to do this today, is to, is to spend so much time depicting the crucifixion, and we will speak to it somewhat, but we can spend so much time uh, depicting the gruesome nature of the crucifixion uh, that maybe we, we begin to lose what really the greater, uh, as, as horrifying as that was, and I don't mean to make light of it, the even greater pain that Jesus endured than even the physical when he would look to the Father and, and, and cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That had to have even been more painful as for the only time in all of eternity, the Father and the Son, if you will, didn't, didn't make eye contact. They were somehow, there was this moment at which the transaction for our sin was paid for and God had to look away from the one who had become sin with our sin. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very... Uh, it's an interesting thing. It's a, it's a painful thing to consider and to contemplate, but it's, it, it probably is even the most, most likely the more painful of all of the things that Jesus endured in this entire thing. And so we'll talk to the crucifixion, but I don't want to overshadow the transaction that took place and the, the real cost of that. Now, um, verse 26 begins. Now, as they led him away, as they led Jesus away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, Simon of Cyrene, uh, Mark tells us, is a gentleman who is uh, also the father of two people named Rufus and Alexander. Simon is from a place called Cyrene, uh, and he's a Cyrenian, which is, in essence, uh, essentially north, northern Africa. They, they believe the area of Libya today. Uh, so he is from North Africa, and as he makes his way over to this area to celebrate the Passover, he has no idea what's about to befall him, the kind of thing that's going to happen in his life, as he is among the crowd, probably having shown up knowing very little of anything about Jesus, he comes to town and he sees this mob mass of people, uh, and this, this person making his way from the place of the scourging where the crossbeam was laid upon his back, uh, and and, and uh, some accounts, some descriptions of this uh, say that not only was he carrying the beam, but his hands were in essence tied to the beam as he carried it. Now, that's telling in that if that's the case, if Jesus would stumble and fall, which we see that he does, there's no way for him to catch himself. He just has to land on his arms with the weight of this thing on his back. It's just, if that's how this whole thing went, there, there's literally no point of this whole thing that is not utterly excruciating and intended by the Romans to be torturous. It's horrifying. So as he is making his way with this, uh, at one point, uh, the guards see a man in the crowd. Just They choose him randomly. His name is Simon, and they press him into service. He does not have a choice. The Romans didn't ask for a volunteer. They put their hand on Simon, and by Roman law, he had to be pressed into service. He could not disobey this order. He came in, and he grabbed a part of this crossbeam, although some accounts say uh, some accounts say that he took one part of the beam and Jesus carried the crossbeam. Other accounts speak uh, of how the, 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 the upright beam actually was was a fixture on the side of the road there uh, where he would be crucified and it was just the cross beam that he would carry to that place. They would remove the, the, the upright beam, set it down when he arrived there, put the cross beam across, put it together, assemble it, and, and such. We don't really know which way that was. There are, there are varying accounts on that, but 
Simon either helped carry a long portion of the of the upright beam or he helped Jesus with a section, maybe the back section of the cross beam. In any case, he comes in contact with Jesus, likely for the first time. And his first encounter with Jesus uh, had to be disturbing to say the least. Uh, Isaiah 52 uh, tells us, as, as really Isaiah 53 begins a couple of verses before in Isaiah 52, where it speaks of him as being marred beyond any man. To look at him was to look into the face and at the body of somebody who didn't even look human anymore because of the scourging. And this is, this is the shocking entrance into introduction with Jesus that Simon experiences. However, interestingly, it's impossible, you would think even just subjectively speaking, this had to impact Simon. But we can actually get some sense really that it probably did because the two men that are mentioned with, uh, in association with Simon of Cyrene, mentioned by Mark, he's their father of, again, Rufus and Alexander. Uh, there is a Rufus that is greeted by Paul well, in the first place, Mark mentions these two people as though other believers would know who they were, uh, which in itself implies that they may have become believers themselves, which may imply that Simon became a believer. But uh, there's a Rufus mentioned by Paul, greeted by Paul in Romans 16. This may be the same man. Uh, there's also an Alexander mentioned by Paul in First and Second Timothy, who is somebody who actually did damage to the church, someone whose faith became shipwreck. Uh, this may be the same Alexander. We don't know that for sure. We can't completely put that together. But it may be that Simon became a believer and these two sons of his may also have been believers and been known by the church. So Simon then begins to carry the cross with Jesus. In verse 27, And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. These may be some of the women from the Galilean ministry that helped to support and came alongside of that ministry, or they may just be women from the crowd. But Jesus, turning to them, verse 28, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren and wombs that never bore, uh, breasts that never nursed. And they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For they, if they do these things in the greenwood, what will be done in the dry? And there were also two others, criminals led with him to be put to death. And so as Jesus is making his way with the crossbeam, uh, there are not only hostile faces in the crowd, there's probably some very confused faces in the crowd. And then on top of that, there are also people in the crowd that have been followers of his. And some of those are these women who are, are mourning over him and weeping over what's going on here. And Jesus, in turn to that, says, Don't weep for me, but rather weep for yourselves and those who will be around in the time of the judgment that is coming. Now, what is he referring to? We've spoken to this earlier, but he's very likely pointing to 70 AD when the Romans will come and crush Jerusalem. Why do I make that association? Because Jesus makes that association in, in, in Luke 19 when he talks about how the day will come when not one stone of this temple will be left upon another, how there will be destruction coming. These kinds of things will take place. Why? Because they did not recognize this the day of their visitation. And Jesus goes on to say, if this, is, if this can happen to the innocent, imagine how bad it's going to be to the guilty in that day. It's a very frightening thought, but again, it's not one that he hasn't already made previously. But he says, weep for those who will be around in that time. Now again, verse 32, there were also two other criminals, two others, criminals led to be put to death uh, with him. And when they came, and when they came to the place called Calvary, uh, which also is called Golgotha. It means the hill of the skull. Uh, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And so they came to this, this hill called Calvary. Uh, we've spoken to this before, but if you're familiar with the story of Abraham offering his son Isaac in, uh, uh, um, back in, uh, in Genesis 22 and 24, God calls Abraham to offer Isaac, and he goes to the, the hill there, which is Mount Moriah. Uh, many hold that that is, in fact, the hill of Calvary, uh, that Jesus was crucified. And hence, when uh, Abraham says to Isaac, as they're making their way up the hill, well, where's the offering for the sacrifice? Here's the, wool, uh, the wood and everything and the fire. Where's the offering? And, and Abraham famously says, the Lord will provide himself an offering, which in, 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 in Isaac's mind meant, well, the Lord will take care of it when we get there. But the word there is Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. That's where we get this idea from. And ultimately, God would provide 
the offering for the sacrifice, presumably upon that very same hill, maybe even in the same spot. And so as Jesus comes to the hill of Calvary, and if you go to Israel today, um, I think it's called Gordon's uh, Calvary, which is uh, General Gordon discovered this location. It's actually, it's, it's interesting today to go there. Uh, the hillside does look like a skull. When you look at it, it's really not hard to see it. Uh, and it does overlook an area that you can, you can look up and see this hill, and you can imagine how the crosses would have been set up on that road, uh, along the road there. Uh, there's a bus terminal right near it now. It's very odd and awkward looking, but, or there was when we were there. Um, but you can see how this could very well have been the spot. Uh, when they arrive at this place, they crucify Jesus with the two criminals. Now you might recall, it wasn't long ago that John and James, Jesus, two of Jesus' disciples, came with their mother and asked Jesus to be able to sit, one on his right hand, one on his left. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? And they very flippantly said, we're able. Now, flippantly, but probably confidently, they didn't feel like they would, they, they, Jesus, we're up to whatever you throw at us. Well, yes, we're worthy in essence. And Jesus said, well, you don't realize what you're, what you're saying here, but you will drink of the cup. Well, here is the cup. And now Jesus is drinking from it. Now, John and his mother were at the cross that day. And you have to wonder if those words didn't haunt them at that moment as they looked at the cross and realized what Jesus had been talking about. You want to sit on my right hand or on my left? First off, that's not mine to give but the Father's. But you, you will drink of this cup. Now, of course, James would become, uh, uh, become martyred. John would become, they would try to kill John, but he eventually would live his days out after being thrown in a vat of oil. He ends up spending his days in Patmos writing the gospel, three letters in the book of Revelation. But he ends up being persecuted and tortured and ultimately and spends time on his island. Uh, and so they would drink the cup, as it were, too. But here they were, the two criminals on one side and on the other. Again, James and John's mother had to have been, again, horrified to, to maybe get that picture in that moment. But then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even as the rulers, uh, but even the rulers uh, with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Now, Jesus prays from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He wasn't speaking about them being innocent of what they had done, but they did not realize the magnitude of what they were doing. If they really believed he was the Son of God, they would never would have crossed their mind to do what they had done. If the Romans recognized who it was they were crucifying, they would never have done such a thing. Nevertheless, they're guilty of what they are doing, but they don't recognize the full extent of it. But Jesus is demonstrating mercy. He is crying out to the Father on their behalf. As he, their creator, is being crucified by them, is, he is calling out to the Father to grant mercy to them because they don't realize what they're really doing. Isaiah 53, again, speaking of the cross, speaks of how he was numbered among the transgressors. Uh, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, talk about how he was numbered among the transgressors and how he also made intercession for the transgressors. Now, in an ultimate sense, his very placement on the cross made intercession. It was an interceding act on our behalf. But nevertheless, he's also praying, even from the cross, for those who are guilty of killing him. And he calls out for God the Father to grant them mercy. Uh, and again, it says how they divided garments and cast lots. Uh, John speaks to this as well, where the other gospel accounts uh, speak of this moment and how, uh, and of course they refer uh, to the Old Testament where it speaks of how they would do this very thing, predictive of this moment uh, and describing the scene of the cross. Here he is paying for the sins of the very men who are down there throwing dice basically to see who gets to take his garment. Why? Because the one garment that he had, which may have actually been, by the way, the garment that Herod put on him. You know, it may not have even been his own. But there, and it's, it, it's a purple garment, and it's one piece, which makes it somewhat valuable. And they take it off of him, which, by the way, had to have been painful for Jesus as well, with the, bloody, the bleeding of his back from the scourging and everything. And to have this cloak on his back, and then to have it pulled off, had to reopen the wounds that had just begun to heal as he was wearing it. And now it's being torn off again, and they're gambling over it to see who gets to keep this souvenir from today's crucifixion. Think of the hardness of the hearts of the men who are doing this. 
Jesus was not the first crucifixion. As a matter of fact, the Romans were not the first ones to invent crucifixion. They just perfected it. But day after day after day, the streets of Rome, as you would enter the city, would be lined with crosses of pe filled with people being crucified for various kinds of crimes. Imagine being a Roman soldier in charge of that kind of thing and seeing this happen day after day and being responsible for either performing it or commanding it, overseeing it, just being having this as part of your vision every day to hear the cries of agony, the blood, the beaten men and women that would be crucified in such a way, these people suffering for hours and hours and hours, as painful as it is for them too, and, and as horrifying as it is, it also had to impact the people who are responsible for doing it. Talk about being calloused. You know, it's interesting, when I went to, uh, this sounds bigger than it was, when I had my brief stint in college, uh, I, I had gone into it wanting to become a police officer and maybe even get in the FBI, some kind of law enforcement kind of a thing. Um, and the thing that actually turned me off about it was because, uh, at least at that time, I don't know if the statistic is any different today, but the statistic of, of cops and marriage was like, there was like a 75% divorce rate in cops. And, uh, and, 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 you know, there was, there was also this... Uh, and the part and parcel with that is this idea that, that a lot of people in that kind of position become very hardened and very cynical. And I know people are police officers that, that have been affected by, you know, constantly dealing with people that are breaking the law and running away from you. And you have to go after people and stuff, and it does something to you. So imagine on this scale what that must be like, the hardness of these people. And so as he's being crucified, they're completely oblivious to the fact that there's something unique going on here in this moment. And so they're they're shooting craps, in essence, to get this garment. That's what the scene looks like. There's really no point in trying to pretty it up. The people stood looking on. Even the rulers with them sneered, saying he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. They didn't even realize that if Jesus had done that, and they would cry to him, come down, save yourself, son of God. If you're the Christ, then save yourself. Mocking him. He saved others. Him, he can, himself, he cannot save. Imagine, not just the physical pain, but just the mocking and the sneering and the sarcasm. Uh, they had their moment now. They've been wanting this for three and a half years, and now they've got their moment. And they're just spitting at him and just seething at him. And he's paying for their sins. They didn't even realize that if Jesus did save himself, he would not be able to save them. To save himself would have meant to not save them. So even in this moment, and, and not responding to show, not, not, not that it would have made any difference to them anyway if he did come off the cross, they wouldn't have been convinced. But even if he did, and they were convinced, they would have missed the bigger point that he's there for them. And again, the soldiers mocked him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself, as they continue to mock him as well. And an inscription was also written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Uh, of course, as you read the gospel accounts, the full statement in essence was, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you ever see, a, 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 typically this is a, like a, a Catholic crucifix will have an I-N-R-I on it. That's Latin for Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, is in essence what those four uh, Latin letters are the first four letters, or first letters of those four words uh, in the Latin. But uh, here in the scriptures, it tells us that it was written in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, so that all who were there could see it. Uh, and uh, Luke does not record it, but the Pharisees took issue with that. You should not put, he's king of the Jews, but he said he's the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. Probably a certain amount of disgust entering his mind at this point, not even wanting to deal with this anymore. But he's written, this is the king of the Jews. And from Pilate's perspective, he's probably sending a message to all of the Jews who have come to Jerusalem at this time. This is what we can do to your king. Stay in line. I mean, don't miss this. There's practical matters at play here too. Even though the truth of the matter is, that sign in truth said the very truth. This is the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals who hanged blasphemed him, or who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you're under the same condemnation? We indeed justly, 
for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Now again, the other accounts paint a fuller picture of this, where at one point in the crucifixion, while all three of them were there, both criminals were mocking him. Both were saying these things to him until one of them had a change of heart at the, at the last hour, in essence. This one criminal was an 11th hour save, and it's been well said that one of them was saved so that no one would lose hope. Even in this last moment, there's a chance to be saved. But only one is shown ever in all of the New Testament. There's only one 1159 save shown in the New Testament, and it's this one so that no one will presume. We ought never think we've always got tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your heart. But this man was fortunate to have that last moment. Only one of the two, uh, as far as we know, came to Jesus and asked him to remember him. And he goes on as he says, this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 42, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. A statement of genuine faith. And Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, there is a theology to this whole thing that, that is worth spending a moment on. Jesus would spend, there would be three days between the, the death and the resurrection of Christ. Uh, we're told how Jesus went into the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive and this kind of a thing. Uh, Jesus told what I don't think is a parable as much as his actual account and in which he talks about uh, a certain man named Lazarus and a rich man. One, uh, both died. One went to go be in Abraham's side. The other one went to a place of torments in Hades. And Jesus describes how there's this gulf between the two. I don't think it's a parable because the story tells what it's about itself. There's nothing hidden about it. There's no symbolism that means some other thing. The story is what it is, and it's not told in type. It's told very straightforwardly. It even names somebody who's a main player. The only time in all of the parables, if it is one, that Jesus does this. So we understand from these things, uh, as the scriptures seem to reveal, that as Jesus goes into the lower part of the earth and he leads this area, Abraham's bosom as we tend to call it because that's, as Jesus told the story about Abraham, he leads this place out and they go to heaven. And that area in this place of Hades is empty now. And when we die, we go to be with the Lord. But Jesus makes the statement, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Now he's not in heaven that day, but he's, he's there in that place as Jesus is about to lead it, and then he goes to heaven after the resurrection. Now, let me say this. Wherever Jesus is, is paradise. That's what makes it paradise. It's not the physical location, not like where the Google Maps says it is. The fact that Jesus is there is what makes it paradise. But nevertheless, this man was consciously going to leave this earth and be in the presence of Jesus from that point on. Now, Paul makes the case to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, okay? There is no in-between period where we are unconscious waiting for the resurrection or something the, the, in the last day. When we take our last breath on earth, glory to God, we take our first breath in heaven. It's over. It's done. We, we leave this earth and we enter into the glory of the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. And Jesus makes the point here to this man who deserved by his own admission to be on this cross, he's actually going to be with him in paradise, now it was about the sixth hour, verse 44, and there was darkness over the whole earth until the ninth hour. And then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now again, as we paint the picture from the, the scope of what the gospels say, this was not the only thing he said. In fact, there were seven statements that Jesus made from the cross, but we'll focus just on a few here that led up to this. John records how on the cross, as, 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 uh, as, as he is there, John, with his own mother, Jesus' mother is also there. Uh, there's a number of the other followers of Jesus. None of the disciples, though, except for John, uh, are there at the cross. And Jesus, from the cross, looks down at John and his own mother, Mary, and says, Woman, behold your son, John, behold your mother. In other words, he places Mary into John's care for the remainder of her time before she passes away. So he takes care of his birth mother, if you will. Uh, he also, from the cross, he cries out, uh, he cries out, as we mentioned earlier, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The answer to that question is as profound as the idea that, that the father could have forsaken the son for that moment. The answer is simple but profound. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? So that you and I would never have to be. So that you and I would never have to experience what he experienced in that moment. As a believer in Christ, as a follower of Jesus, you will never have to know what that moment felt like for Jesus. Outside of Christ, though, that is the only thing you will know. And so he cries out these things. There was also an earthquake, we're told. The sun is darkened. The veil of the temple is torn in two. There's an earthquake. Some like to say that the darkness over that part of the land was because of an eclipse. If it was an eclipse, it was a miraculous eclipse because the Passover took place during a full moon. And so for an eclipse to take place right then would have been a miracle in itself. So we can't just write it off. Although God may have used an eclipse of some kind to do it, that in itself is miraculous. But darkness comes over the whole land. Nobody, it's just, it's just you know, I like to think of it like it's described in Exodus. You remember one of the plagues was darkness, and it was described as a darkness that could be felt. And I have to wonder if this wasn't very much the same kind of a thing. And so as this darkness comes over the land, and he cries out, it is finished, to tell us die, paid in full. Something that Paul makes a very strong case for in much of his writings, not the least of which is Colossians, where he says that all of these things, these feasts, these festivals, these new moons and such, these things are a shadow of what is to come, but the reality is Christ. He took the handwriting of our transgressions that was against us and he nailed it to the cross. He writes these things, Paul, in retrospect, writing about those things that he fought against until he came to see the risen Christ himself. He says these things so that we understand in that moment, it is finished. That's the moment where the transaction takes place. The sin of the world, past, present, future, all sin of all of mankind in all of time is placed upon him in that moment. The father turns away as in his holiness he cannot look upon sin. And the son for the only time in eternity does not have connection with the father in some kind of way. And he takes our sins upon himself. He who knew no sin took our sin upon himself. The just for the unjust, the innocent for the guilty. And having done that, verse 46 again, he cries out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And so when the centurion saw what had happened, remember the centurion, this hardened possibly bloodthirsty man who has seen and, and, and overseen and participated in how many crucifixions. He saw what had happened and he glorified God by saying, certainly this man was a righteous man, an unbeliever, a Roman, the last one to inspect the Passover lamb of God. Certainly this was a righteous man. And as another account puts it, certainly this man was a son of God. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had happened or what had, been, what had been done, beat their breasts and returned, possibly mourning, possibly just stricken at what had happened in this moment. I also don't want to move on before we talk about the, the veil being rent in the temple from top to bottom. I find that to be significant. The veil was a barrier. If nothing else, it was a psychological message that said, you are not welcome to enter this just because you feel like it. There is a barrier, a division between you and God. There's a separation that exists. But when that temple veil tore from top to bottom, and I think it's significant that it was top to bottom, man didn't open the veil. God did. It's as if he tore it open and now made the way possible where even as the writer of Hebrews says, we can now boldly approach the throne of grace to obtain mercy in our time of need something that was unheard of in the entire Old Testament economy, but now is available to those who follow Jesus. We can now enter the Holy of Holies. Why? Because that which separated us has been taken out of the way. Now, verse 49, all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. 
Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. This is Joseph of Arimathea. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. Now Joseph of Arimathea is a council member, which is to say he's a member of the Sanhedrin. However, he and likely Nicodemus were not present uh, at the quote-unquote trial of Jesus at the hands of the Sanhedrin. They were not consenting to his death. If they were there, they were against it, but chances are they may not have even been there, considering the kind of mob mentality that existed. This man went to Pilate, Joseph that is, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now typically, you would leave a body on the cross, even after this person had died, again, to send a message. And you would let the birds come and pick away at it, and it would just be this grotesque, stinky, filthy, rotten stench kind of a thing going on there, because it was supposed to scare people away from, again, committing crimes in Rome. But... Pilate and Rome in general would allow, if a family member or somebody wanted to come and claim the body, they would sometimes be gracious and allow them to do so. In this case, Joseph goes there and he asks for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, verse 53, wrapped it in linen and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So what is happening here now, uh, we're going to continue here too, but what's happening is that Joseph has asked for the body, he owns a tomb, and it's arguable about whether that's maybe a family tomb. Based on the location, some people say it's not, because who would, if you had money to buy a family tomb, why would you buy one right by where they do crucifixions? Uh, on the other hand, we, we don't know. It generally is presumed this is a family tomb that he owns, uh, but he, he, he wants to to put Jesus in it. Now, I don't think Joseph knows it's only for the weekend, but he's going to use this tomb to put Jesus in. But they're hurried because the Sabbath is coming, and as sundown approaches, they have to get, they, they can't do what they know they rightfully should do in terms of preparing him for a proper burial. So they quickly, you know, do some preparation just to, just to be able to put him in this tomb. But the women are watching because they're going to come back later and give him a proper burial. Why? Because they're devoted to him, because they love him, because they care about him, and they believe he deserves better than this. So they watch. Where is he? So they can come back to this place after the Sabbath. And that's where verse chapter 24 begins. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, there are as many books as there, there are actually way more than as many books as there are theories as to how to put together each event uh, in the post-resurrection. I'm not really going to spend time trying to put together my version of that. I'm just going to go ahead and interject from the other Gospels as we go, but stick pretty much to what Luke is saying here. Now, when they arrive at the stone, moved away from the tomb, prior to their arrival, the guards that were around the tomb uh, were startled by the appearance of an angel that moved that stone. It said they became as dead men. They were afraid. They were terrified at what they saw. As the earth shook and the angel moved the stone away. Who were the soldiers? Uh, there are some, uh, there, there's, there's enough discussion about the two to say that there's a there's pretty fair uh, bit of, bit of uh, evidence to support the idea that they were, well, they, they were either Romans or they were temple guards. We don't know for sure. Generally, it's held they were Roman guards. However, there is some question about that because, uh, as you uh, might recall, uh, as, the, as the Roman guards, if they were Roman, were put around the tomb, when Jesus rises from the dead and the tomb is empty and they tell the, the priests what happened and the priests bribe them and give them a story to run with saying that they will protect the Roman guards, I don't know that the priests would have had any real sway with Pilate or the governors of any kind if the Romans fell asleep on the job and, the, and, the, and the, the disciples came and stole the body. I'm not really sure the penalty for that would be death, and I'm not sure that the Pharisees or priests would be able to stop that. Maybe they could? I don't know. That's one of the reasons why it may very well be that they were temple guards around there. In either case, both had a vested interest in making sure nothing happened to that tomb. Pilate also said to them when they came requesting a guard, you have a guard, go make it as secure as you know how. The first half of that statement could simply mean you're, you're being given a guard, or it might mean you have a guard of your own. It's hard to know exactly what that means. And when Pilate told them to go make it as secure as you know how, 
Well, the Pharisees would have no part in making this, the tomb secure if the Romans were doing it. And so it's hard to say. It, 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 there's six of one, half a dozen of the other on that one. But in any case, whether it was temple guards or Roman guards, they clearly had a vested interest in making sure that the tomb stayed secure. Nevertheless, it did not. And just so we're clear on this, when the angel rolled the stone away, it wasn't so Jesus could get out. It's so that we could see in. Okay? Jesus, we find in his resurrection body, has the ability to appear in places just to materialize. He doesn't have to open doors to show up in places. He just appears. And so the stone was not going to keep. He wasn't like, okay, guys, third day, open up. It's not like that's really going on at all. He, he was already probably out of the tomb by the time the angel came and opened it. But the women are coming to the tomb to give him a proper burial, and they're wondering, well, how are we going to deal with this stone? How are we going to move this thing? Now, we've talked about before, but the stone is a large wheel-shaped stone weighing potentially a ton, and it's in a channel in front of the in front of this tomb, and you'd use some kind of a lever, imagine like a crowbar kind of a setup. You'd pry this thing up and, and lift it over a little bit of a hump that kept it in place so that it would then lock in place. So if the, if the stone is here and here's the opening, you'd lift it up just, just over this, and then it would fall into place and be a door that was virtually immovable. Now, if there were Roman soldiers there and they sealed the tomb, then what that means is, is they would have put a certain Roman imprimatur on there about, that if you broke it, it was under penalty of death from Rome. You didn't break a Roman seal. Um, so it, that may be what's going on there as well. So the angel, however, no biggie just moves the stone out of the way. So the women, when they get there, they find the stone laying on the ground. Problem solved. We don't know how, but the stone's not there anymore. And they look, and he's gone. Now again, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Verse 3, when they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus means they did not see the body of the Lord Jesus. It didn't mean they looked all over the place and couldn't find it anywhere. It's a little thing. It's not a big, giant, cavernous thing that goes on for half a mile. It's, you know, imagine, uh, you know, like if, if it's the tomb, if in fact the tomb we see is the one that it was, it's a space of about, you know, about th 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 two-thirds of the stage and about to the end of the stage. And that's about how big the tomb area is. So it wasn't like they had to look hard. If, if he's not there, he's not there. And they could tell that right away. So they did not, the body was not there, is in essence what's being said. And so what happened is they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Now that is verbatim what Jesus has been telling his followers. So the angels are aware of what's going on as he's going about his ministry. But he says, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. Like he said, you remember when he said these things? So, there, it's, you don't want to call it a rebuke so much, but there's sort of a, well, didn't he say that he was going to rise from the dead? Why are you looking for him? He said he would be alive the third day. And you're coming here and you're surprised that he's not here. So verse 8, and they remembered his words. And then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, uh, who we find out earlier in Luke chapter 8. Um, and Mary Magdalene has actually gotten a bit of a bad rap. Uh, all we know about Mary Magdalene is that she followed Jesus, and at one point, she had seven demons cast out of her. We don't know that she was a prostitute. We don't know that she was the woman in John 8 who was caught in adultery. We don't know any of those things, even though it's often been ascribed to her. Uh, matter of fact, that we mentioned the Passion of the Christ earlier. They make that connection in there. Again, it's a, Catholic theology puts them together uh, in, that, in that regard, puts, puts the idea of Mary and, and the fact that uh, uh, the city she's from had a reputation for those things, apparently, but she herself, it never says in Scripture that any of those things were true of her, just that she had been delivered from demonic possession and that she followed Jesus. Uh, so that's Mary Magdalene. Joanna, who uh, we find out also earlier in the Gospel, she is uh, she's, uh, actually the wife of a servant of Herod. Also, Mary, the mother of James, this would be James the Less, as we sometimes refer to him, and the other two women with them, or the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles, and their words seemed to them like idle tales, or literally like nonsense, and they did not believe them. 
Uh, now, also during this time, Mary Magdalene has had a personal encounter with Jesus. He has appeared to her in the garden as well. Uh, and so she is coming back with this, not only testimony of with the angels, but with an eyewitness testimony of having seen Jesus alive. But they don't believe any of this. The guys don't believe what's happening here. Why? Because they're women, frankly. Because they're women. A woman's testimony did not count for anything in that society and culture. You know, today we argue about women aren't getting the same CEO pay as men are, and that's wrong and everything. But imagine how bad it was then, uh, where women, like, just were not taken seriously at all. Except to God. Who's the first eyewitness of his resurrection? Mary Magdalene, a woman. Who are the first ones to come back with testimony that he's alive? He's not in the tomb anymore. We've seen the angels. He's alive. Women. That's also another reason to hold to the validity of the gospel accounts. Because if you were making this stuff up, you'd never say that a woman was the first one to see it. You would never be taken seriously. But it was what happened, and so they recorded it. So Mary Magdalene comes. The women come. They don't believe it, but Peter, and John records in his own gospel, chapter 20, that Peter and John together arose and ran to the tomb. John would go on to explain how he outran Peter uh, and stopped at the edge of the tomb and didn't go in, but Peter just ran right in, and he started to examine the grave clothes and everything, and, and, uh, and they would see the, 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 the wrapping for Jesus' body still in a shell type of form, uh, undisturbed in that position, but the head cloth folded up the napkin that would have been the, the head cloth over him, folded up in another area. I don't think this was the Shroud of Turan. I hope that didn't step on anyone's toes. I don't think we have any picture of what Jesus looked like uh, impressed upon cloth or anything like that. But, but we do see uh, from, the, from what's described in the Gospels is that the shell that Jesus was in, in his crucified body, was still firm, like in the same kind of position that it would have been if a body were still in it. But it wasn't. He was gone. He was gone. And the headpiece was over there so that there'd be no mistaking. He's not here. He's risen. And so they find the, the linen cloths lying by themselves. Uh, he and really they departed marveling at what had happened. Now verse 13 is one of the most interesting passages in the Gospels I find. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And so it was while they conversed in reason that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So a stranger comes up and begins to walk with them, and they don't know it's Jesus. Now, we don't know if they just didn't recognize him, or maybe he had some kind of a cloak or a hood over his head that they couldn't see. Somehow, they're, you know, maybe it was just, for some reason, Jesus just wanted to let this thing unfold for a little bit before he sort of lets, they, they discover who he is. But they don't know who he is. And so verse 17, he says to them, what kind of conversation is this that you're having with one another? As you walk and are sad, and then one of the one of uh, the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, "Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days?" And he said to them, "What things?" Now imagine this. Th this is actually kind of funny. Uh, Jesus is walking with them, and they're talking about the crucifixion, and all this kind of stuff, and what's happened. And Jesus is kind of proud of them. So, what's going on, guys? What are you talking about? really? What, what's all this you're talking What is this strange thing of which you speak? You know, and then it just sort of kind of plays them on a little bit. And so, uh, so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Now, one thing I don't want to miss here. For all of the arguing about how you fit three days between Friday and Sunday, it doesn't matter. Why? Because they saw it as three days. So whether it's sundown on Thursday, whether it's Friday morning, whatever point it is that you start to calculate your three days, and that's a fair discussion, by the way. I'm not minimizing it. But whatever, the, whatever you arrive at, in their minds, it was three days. This is the third day since these things happened. Argument solved, however we work that out is another thing. But from their minds, this is now the third day, just a detail that we don't want to miss. So, so they have now said to him that they were hoping that this Jesus that they have been speaking to him about was the one, the one who would come to deliver Israel. And Jesus responds, or they go on, I should say, but um, 
Uh, yes, and certain, uh, certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body, and they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things uh, and, and enter into his glory. O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. He points them to that which was said beforehand. He says, how is it that you're so slow to believe these things? Not only had they written about it before, but Jesus himself had spoken about these things during his ministry. In verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, that would have been epic. Can you imagine, not just a great teacher telling you about how the Old Testament pointed to Jesus, but Jesus himself pointing out all the little nuances throughout the Old Testament and saying, this is how, this is how I've been kind of laying this out up until now. This is, this is all the roadmaps that existed. Oh my goodness, that must have been awesome. And so Jesus explains these things concerning himself. Now they, they still, by the way, don't know it's him. He's not revealed himself to them yet. He's simply sort of rebuking them a little bit for not believing what the scriptures have said, but they still don't know it's him. Verse 28, then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone on farther, but they constrained him saying, abide with us, for it's toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. And now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And they vanished from the, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? And so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. So somewhere along the way, he has also appeared to Simon in this whole thing. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in breaking bread. Now, he may have been breaking bread similarly to how he did as he instituted the Last Supper, or he may have just been having a meal and somehow they may have seen the nail prints in his, in his wrists. Um, again, Luke doesn't record it, but there are also instances after his resurrection but prior to his ascension where he, uh, where he spends time appearing to them over a period of time. Uh, he, uh, he meets them on the seashore. And he calls out to them, you know, hey, have you caught anything tonight? No, we've not caught anything. Throw your nets on the other side of the boat. It's the Lord. And so Peter swims to the shore, and they, he's making breakfast for them on the shore. Where did he get fish? Doesn't matter. He's God. So he's, he's making food for them. They're out all night trying to catch something to eat. He's there on the shore cooking breakfast already. And they come up, and, and it's interesting. As they come around him, and he sees there, it says that no one dared ask who he was because they knew who he was. But they didn't recognize him in essence. There's, they, there's something about his appearance that they, they, they knew it was him, but there was still some question about something. And from these things we surmise, uh, and, and also when John mentions as he gets his vision of heaven in the Revelation, he sees uh, a lamb on the throne as, as it had been slain. We wonder if from these things, if Jesus bore the marks of his crucifixion after the resurrection, if in his glorified body he bears the marks. When Jesus appears to them in the upper room, they think they see a ghost. They don't recognize him. Um, there are things about him that, that, that leave them unsettled, but yet they know it's him, so we wonder if he bears the marks. Now in verse 36, and as we come now to the, really the closing stretch of the Gospel of Luke, it says, now as they said these things, as they're telling the disciples about their experience just now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But... <laughs> But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they'd seen a spirit. So Jesus just shows up in the room. There he is. They're talking. They're listening to this whole account. All of a sudden, there's Jesus. Hey, guys. Peace to you. First word out of his mouth to the disciples after his resurrection is peace to you. But they were terrified, frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet that it is myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, but while, he, while they uh, still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? 
And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Uh, it wasn't even necessarily that he was hungry as much as he was demonstrating that he was physically there with them. Uh, you see that I have flesh and bone and that I'm eating in front of you. I'm, I'm really here. And so they, they're, they're, they're sort of staggering in disbelief at what's going on, the, the, the incredible nature of what is happening before them. Jesus is calming them. He's eating in front of them, assuring them that he's actually there. They've not seen a spirit. Now, again, Luke doesn't record this, but we find out from John's gospel that Thomas is not there at the first appearance of Jesus to his disciples. And so, uh, whereas nobody is believing the story of the women in this kind of thing, not only does whether well, Thomas heard it or not, the other stories and accounts are at any point during the course of that week, but he doesn't believe the disciples, okay? His guys that he's been serving with for the last three and a half years, he does not believe them that they've seen Jesus. So a week later, Jesus shows up again. Thomas is with him this time. And he says, Thomas, here, put your finger in the nail prints of my hands and put your hand in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but be believing. And Thomas famously says, my Lord and my God, literally, the Lord of me, and the God of me. The idea here that he is not just simply reacting and saying, oh my God, it's not like that at all. He's acknowledging who Jesus is. All doubts are settled. We call him Doubting Thomas. He was only that for a week. Okay, but that name is stuck. But Jesus showed himself to Thomas. And interestingly, tradition holds that Thomas would then go off and evangelize India uh, and, and become sort of the, the patron apostle there in India. And so this is now, the disciples are now aware of what's going on, or he's, he's revealed himself to them in verse 44. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So in other words, the entire Old Testament. Uh, the, the Old Testament in the Jewish Bible is, can, is basically split up into three things, the law, the prophets, and the writings, and that's what Jesus is saying here. In all of the, old, in all of the scripture to that point, uh, he begins, he explains them that all these things had to be fulfilled, which were in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And so they become privy now to the same kind of blessing that the two apostles on the road to Emmaus, disciples on the road to Emmaus experienced. And the scriptures are open to them and they comprehend them now and how these things work. And then he said to them, verse 46, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Paul would say this is the gospel. Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I declare to you the gospel that Jesus died according to the scriptures, and then he would go on to say that he also rose again according to the scriptures. Uh, it is not simply that Jesus went to the cross and died. It is also that he rose again. Death could not hold him down because if it could, it would imply that he had sin and therefore death could have a hold. And therefore, he had no ability to pay for our sins. But the fact is he had no sin on him, uh, of his own. He only took ours upon himself. Therefore, death could not hold him. Sin had no place in his life, and therefore there was no penalty for him to have to endure. He did that for us, but he himself knew no sin. So he, not only, had, he only died according to the scriptures, but he also rose from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And of course, we understand that Jesus would give the great commission in, in Matthew 20, verses, uh, 28, verses 19 and 20. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all the things that I have told you, along with you always, even to the end of the age. And so the idea here is that they're now being commissioned. However, he goes on, uh, verse 48, and you are witnesses of these things. Now, the word there for witnesses is the word martyrs. Martyrs, martyr, martyrus is the Greek. The idea there is that we think of a martyr as someone who dies for their faith. That's typically what we think of when we hear the word martyr. And that would be true. But the word martyr literally just means witness. However, in terms of Christ, and, and there have been other things in history that people have died for, for their testimony as well, but the implication here uh, that we extrapolate later is the fact that you sometimes are called to even give the ultimate sacrifice for your faith in Christ. But your witnesses of these things, and they're to start in Jerusalem. Why? Because the gospel comes first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so the good news would come to them first of his resurrection. And, and of course, we've spoken in the book of Acts, picks up that story, volume two of Luke. Verse 49, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. 
Now, in this moment, John in chapter 20 of his gospel also mentions that at this point, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? So John, along with the other 10, the 11 disciples who were there and whoever else was in that room at that time, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. At that moment, they become what we would call New Testament believers. They are now indwelled by the Holy Spirit. It is no longer a theoretical thing that the Holy Spirit will come and be with you and will be in you. Now they become the ones who first experience the reality of the Holy Spirit within them. Now he's going to also endue them with power from on high. That will happen in Acts chapters 1 and 2, where they, uh, where they uh, are, are, Luke reminds us of this, of this promise that Jesus gives, and then in Acts chapter 2, as the Holy Spirit uh, falls upon them, and they, uh, they begin to speak in these unknown tongues, and they begin to just glorify God, and it begins, in a, what essentially becomes the last days begin at that point. Why? Because Joel says so. In Joel chapter 2, he says, Behold, in the last days I will send forth my spirit. My old men will dream dreams, young men will see visions, and all these these kinds of things. And so we now have entered into this period of time, which we're still in today. But that power was going to come from on high, and it wasn't coming yet at this point. So they were to wait in Jerusalem until that promise, uh, until that happened, and they were endued with that power from on high. Now Luke then jumps ahead, uh, and again, he does not include some of the other uh, post-resurrection appearances prior to the, re uh, the ascension, so he moves right to the ascension. In verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And now it came to pass while he blessed them that he, parted, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And so the gospel of Luke comes to an end. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed that ride through the gospel. I don't know how many weeks we've been in it, but I've loved going through the uh, the story of Christ with you guys, and and um, and uh, next uh, uh, two weeks from today, we're actually going to start another book study. Uh, uh, we'll start the book of Joshua. So I encourage you guys to go ahead and start reading the book of Joshua, and uh, we're going to make our way through that, and that's going to be a great time. Um, uh, there are a few copies of Wiersbe's commentary on the book of Joshua on the back table, so push and shove your way to grab one of those if you like. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and close in prayer here in a moment. Of course, I invite you all to stick around and enjoy the, the potluck. I'll pray for the food now so we can just kind of dig in and all that kind of thing once we start getting things out. But um, as we close the Gospel of Luke, I want to just remember that Jesus sent his disciples on a commission to make disciples of all the nations. Discipleship is one of the things that this church is about. That's why we go through the Word of God verse by verse. We are we're discipling ourselves as we take in the Word of God, and the teaching really is, is intended for that purpose. Um, but discipleship follows conversion. You can learn about Jesus. You can learn sort of what it means to follow him, but you don't actually follow him until you are a believer. And so I always like to give an opportunity to receive the gospel for any in here who don't know Jesus personally. Uh, even though I know most everybody in the room, I never like to just sort of get in the habit of not doing this because I like to make sure we understand how important this is on a regular basis. Making a personal commitment to Christ is pivotal. It's pivotal. The work of sanctification, walking with Jesus, is the work of a lifetime. But conversion happens in a moment. It's a moment where you finally surrender. You throw up the white flag. You are no longer the Lord of your life. Jesus is. But that takes a personal decision and a commitment to him. And so I want to make sure I give that opportunity as we close in prayer right now. And if you're ready to come to Jesus, you'll have that opportunity in just a moment. Father, we thank you for just giving us your word as we spend time in the gospel, learning of the life and the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, we are reminded of so many things that fuel our faith. We're reminded of the good news that Jesus came into this world as a demonstration of God's love that if anyone would believe in him, we not perish but have everlasting life. And in his death on the cross, in his resurrection from the grave, things that have been foretold from throughout all of Scripture, when we see these things and we read them afresh and, and are reminded of them, Father, again, I just pray it would fuel us and ignite us, Lord, to just to go out and just to, 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 to take that, that great commission personally, to be about the business of heaven, of leading people to know Jesus, You've given us the opportunity to be saved, and that means that we don't ever have to experience separation from you. 
and an eternity in a place that is real and actual and horrible and separate from you. But instead, you've given us the promise of eternity with you in paradise where you are. And Father, there's a fork in the road that we all have to come to, and we recognize this. We will either put our faith in you or we will not. And today, Father, I just pray that you be speaking to the hearts of any within earshot right now that have not made a personal commitment to Christ, they've not left behind the old life, taken up their cross and followed after him as he said we need to. If that's you here this morning and you're ready to come to Jesus, to repent of your sin, repent means to turn away 180 degrees from your sin which means from your lifestyle, from the things that separate you from him, the sin in your life that is an offense to him, to say you're sorry for it and to leave it behind and to follow after him, letting him be the Lord of your life and not just the savior of your soul. If you're ready to make that commitment, then I want to give you that invitation right now. Just repeat after me a, a prayer that's not complicated, it's not supposed to be, but it might be something new for you. It's a way for you to confess your sins to him, something you may never have thought about doing before. So if you're ready, I invite you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner, that I'm guilty of sin, not just mistakes, not just bad choices, but of sin. And my sin offends you. But I'm sorry for my sin. I know that I'm guilty of it, but I know that Jesus has come to pay the debt that I owe. And when he went to the cross and he bled and died, he did that for me. And I thank you. Help me to leave the old life behind, my sin that weighs me down, and instead follow after you, to allow you to be the Lord of my life, the master of my destiny. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love and your mercy. And now I just surrender to you. Take me by the hand until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to invite you to stay afterwards so we can talk to you and pray with you again and give you a Bible, help you learn how it means to walk with Jesus. Uh, the rest of you, why don't we all stand? We're going to sing a closing song and then uh, we're going to get the food out here and hope you all can stick around and enjoy with us.
thank you and bless you that you took that down upon yourself. Help us to live for you, even as you are willing to die for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And God, we pray that you bless the food that we're going to share in this afternoon. We pray that, Father, our fellowship would be sweet, the food would be nourishing to our bodies. This would be a great time of fellowship as we gather around you and enjoy this meal together. Thank you, Lord, so much for those that provided it and helped put it together and for all the stomachs that are going to take it in. We just praise you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If we could have a few folks stick around, just help us get some tables and chairs together too. That would be great.